him tonight. Uh, the uh, kind of weather keeps people away, I guess. If you want to get there, you get there anyhow. Dave, let's pray, please. <coughs> Yes, do. Lord, I pray that we need that we hear and learn here tonight. We'll put them deep within our heart that we'll be able to recall the mind of you. By your Holy Spirit, you give us direction. I thank you for this time to see Jesus. Yes, thank you. Oh, well, we're still in the uh, same old chapter. 11th chapter of Hebrews move down a little bit <coughs> well you know this is the period when everybody uh, saved or unsaved thinks about Jesus we see all the street lights and signs uh, you know reminding us of Christmas and the preachers preach about this usually so often and the subject usually is some character very often those who are in the stable you notice how much the world knows about the uh, birth of Jesus because you see the stable and you see the wise men offering gifts and then it were never in the stable anyhow <coughs> We say there were three wise men. How do we know? Maybe 33. Three different kinds of gifts doesn't mean there were three kinds of men. Again, it could have been 33. But remember that when the wise men came, they did not keep, come seeking a babe. They came seeking the young child. And the area from which they come, it, it must have taken them at least two years to get to the place where they were seeking him. You remember Herod decided to liquidate every child under two years of age. If they were seeking the babe, surely they'd have said every child under six months of age. But you know, <clears throat> one of the most exalting chapters about what is gripping me so much these days, that the majesty of the Lord Jesus Christ, is in the first chapter in Hebrews. Let's look at it for a moment here. There are so many titles given to Jesus. If you ask for the titles given to Jesus, usually people recite Isaiah. His name should be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, <coughs> Funny Prince of Peace, which are all okay, of course. You can get my water tonight. Okay, it's okay. Okay. But look at Hebrews 1 here. God who at sundry times and in divers manners spake in time past to the fathers by the prophets hath in these last days emphasizing that again if it was the last days two thousand years ago how much nearer are we to this today revelation begins the things which will shortly come to pass and that was written two thousand years ago how much nearer are we to the awesome events in uh, revelation than when that epistle was written or that book was written <coughs> Okay, verse 2, hath, this God hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son. That's one title, his Son. Number two, he hath appointed heir of all things. Number three, by whom also he made the worlds. Number four, being the brightness of his glory. Number five, the express image of his person. Upholding all things by the word of his power. When he had by himself purged our sins. I love that phrase. It liquidates all the nonsense about the Virgin Mary finishing up what Jesus began. It terminates all our ideas that we can add something. This very epistle says there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins. I remember when a little boy in England we used to sing hymns, memorize many of them, which I can still remember, thank the Lord. <clears throat> and one of those hymns says, Not all the blood of beasts on Jewish altars slain could give one guilty conscience peace or wash away one stain but Christ the heavenly lamb 
takes all our sins away. A sacrifice of nobler name and richer blood than they. <coughs> we used to sing wonderful hymns, wonderful old hymns there in, in street meetings too, I think. Thank you so much. Appreciate that. And one of the hymns says that though millions there but the cross of been supplied still it flows as fresh as ever from the Saviour's wounded side none need perish again here is the majesty of this thing that Jesus is the altar and he's the sacrifice and he's the priest he's everything all in himself these titles just uh, stir me to my very depths <coughs> When he had by himself purged our sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, being made so much better than angels, as he hath by inheritance obtained a more excellent sacrifice unto the, uh, than they. For unto which of the angels said he at any time, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. And again I will be to him a father, he shall be unto me a son. And again, when he bringeth the first begotten into the world, he saith, And let all the angels of God worship him. Verse 8, But unto the Son he saith, Thy throne, O God, is for ever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of thy kingdom. <coughs> I preached, or at least I tried to preach Sunday night on uh, worship. And I remembered when I got home, as I often do, since my memory slips a lot, I'd left some vital things out. I say that praise is the gateway to worship. Prayer is the gateway to intercession. Let all the angels of God worship him. Do you know how precious worship is? Somebody once thought it was up for bids, for offers. So the devil came and said to Jesus, you just bow the knee once to me. All you have to do, I'm not asking you to worship me or kiss me, just bow the knee which is subordination. When I bow, I admit somebody on the throne is above me. I'm inferior. And the devil says, you just bow down and worship me, I'll give you all the kingdoms of this world. I've often wondered why Jesus didn't rebuke him and call him a liar. They're not yours to give. In a sense, they are. Now, what did he mean? Do you think that Jesus was on a mountain there and, and he just saw the Medo-Persian Empire and other empires. The greatest military machine in the world was operating then. That was the marching millions of Rome that got to my country. We lived in the city, Martha and I, city of Bath in England. The Romans established that 55 BC. They opened up the only hot spring that's there. It's still there with uh, beautiful monuments around of Tiberius Caesar and Galicula and uh, all the Caesars <coughs> they were there I say and, and here, are the mar here are the millions marching in the Roman Empire the majesty of the Greeks was still there they were, they'd still conquered the world intellectually I don't think he was thinking of the <coughs> what we call real estate today I don't think he showed them the kingdom, say, of India and Africa and Asia and so forth. I think he meant infinitely more than that. I think he meant, I'll give you all the kingdoms of the world. I'll give you the intellectual kingdoms. I'll give you the kingdom of wealth. I'll give you everything that this world operates on. I'll give you every one of them if you'll only bow down to me. You see, he'd seen the inexplicable and ununderstandable glory when the devil was in heaven, he saw the angels bow down and worship him. He saw the glory of God. And something in his heart said, well, I want to sit on the circle of the earth. I want to be equal with God. Don't care what it costs me. And he never forgot that glory. He never forgot the song that they were singing, holy, holy, holy. Ceasing not by day or night to sing holy, holy, holy. He was still blinded with that glory. And he says, if you'll only fall down and worship me, <coughs> I'll give you all the kingdoms of the world. But he says, that the Lord here says, uh, unto, the uh, but unto the Son he saith, Thy throne, O God, forever and ever. 
is a scepter of thy king. The scepter is that thy kingdom is a scepter of righteousness. Some of you remember Hitler, most of you don't. Hitler strutted round in his, down in his uniform, shook his fist into the face of the world and said, I, I heard him many times, he, he had a horrible voice, but boy, he could stir people. I mean, he had a demon controlling him. And you'd hear his guttural voice and he, he'd say how, much, how he would conquer the world, you know, and he had that tremendous deep German, I don't know, kind of a tang at the end of his voice. And he would stand and say, I am going to build a third Reich. And when I finish this Second World War, this, this Reich is going to stand, the Third Reich is going to stand for a thousand years. Well, he didn't miss it by much, it lasted almost a thousand weeks. Not quite. But this Kingdom of Jesus Christ is, is totally independent of wars coming and countries collapsing and all the trickery that comes in with philosophies they've all passed away, but this, his throne is forever and ever. I don't know if it's in our hymn book, I'd like, we, we sing a nice hymn I think at the end of most of our meetings now and you remember the final chorus is holy, holy, holy. <clears throat> but there's another great vesper hymn in England that they sing, the day thou gave us Lord is ended, the darkness falls at thy behest, to thee our morning hymn ascended, thy praise shall sanctify our let rest. I can remember as a little boy reaching up the pew and hanging on to it, you know, even if the preacher had been boring, which our preacher specialised in. <clears throat> but the meeting always finished on that good note. So be it, Lord, the last stanza says, so be it, Lord, thy throne shall never like earth's proud empires pass away. Thy kingdom stands and grows forever till all thy creatures own thy sway. I discover now, uh, I wouldn't say how recently I was in a church, when I asked for a hymn nobody could sing it. They sing so many choruses over and over and over, and hey, you, do you not, do you not, do you not songs do? The English people say, of course, America spoils so many things. <coughs> okay, excuse me. <coughs> it doesn't, because England invented the jet engine, you know, and America improved on that. We invented the steam engine, America improved on that. Uh, the Scottish people say that they uh, invented the TV. You know, I didn't discover what that TV is all about. Do not T stands for terror and V for violence? It's a good thing they admit that. TV is only for terror and violence. Earth's proud empires pass away. You haven't given a passing thought to Genghis Khan today or Philip of Macedon or any of the major characters in history. Did you think about Julius Caesar today? Oh, you must be terribly forgetful. No? Didn't even think about Charlie Chaplin. Do you wonder the, world talk, the book talks about the world and the fashion of it passes away so terribly. It's, so, it, it's about as reliable as snowflakes. <coughs> thy kingdom stands and grows forever till all thy creatures own thy sway. What, what an amazing experience that's going to be. Last week we did not take this study in uh, Hebrews. The week before we took a story, study incomplete because, you know, I, as far as I'm concerned, I think you could study one of these char characters for maybe ten weeks in a row. That is one night a week. We're condensing the whole lifespan of men, some of them, that live four, five, six hundred. Methuselah was 969 when he died. If he got Social Security at 65, he'd have been well off, wouldn't he? <coughs> and these other characters, how long was this other car? Enoch lived, it's easy to remember that, he lived 365 years, one year for each day, day in the year. Going back to this character, let's go in Hebrews 11 here. <clears throat> Again, the key of the, of the book and the key of your life and mine is verse 6. Without faith, it is impossible to please him. It doesn't say without education. It doesn't say without wealth. It doesn't say without prosperity. 
it says without faith and faith isn't something that runs around in our minds or in our hearts a little later it says James says show me your faith again faith James says faith without works is dead <clears throat> nor being warned of God in verse 7 of things not seen as yet well didn't we say that's what faith is all about faith is a conviction of the reality of the unseen it's as real when God says it as though the thing was standing in front of you you say to this man show me your faith he can show you his faith but if you across the page or maybe you have to turn back to the page in the 10th chapter verse 36 it says ye have need of patience after you've done the will of God that you might receive the promise one of the most difficult things I'm sure at least with people I try to counsel I've been counseling a guy would you believe it in Brisbane Australia he's phoned me three times this week well, it cost him a fortune what's the difficulty I'm trying to find the will of God there's only one thing more difficult than finding the will of God that's doing it when you know what it is what's it say in this verse you have need of patience after you've done the will of God why well, did no need uh, <coughs> pay, patience what was he to do he was to build an ark how long did he do it for more than a hundred years don't you think they just about exhausted all their sarcasm and uh, jeers and foolish talking at him building that ark when they'd never seen an ark what in the world is he doing he's going to take animals and everything in it no the requirement of God is not anything that's material outside of us it is our degree of faith how does faith come faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God reading the word and the spirit who inspires that word suddenly makes it alive to you and from there you have no doubts at least I don't God has said it here it is this is the will of God for me not the will of God maybe for Dale or someone else but this is God's will for me therefore I have to do it God starts working in the heart of Noah and he's over a hundred years building the ark God started working in the heart of Abraham when he was 75 and finished working with him when he was 175 so cheer up you have a long way to go a hundred years and he blundered and staggered around and yet God didn't give up on him I was reading there the 51st of Isaiah there today what does it say I called Abraham alone did he go alone you say he stepped out in he stepped out in faith but at the same time he stepped out in disobedience God told him to go alone he took his uncle with him he took his nephew Lot with him what happened he had terrible trouble till he got rid of them but there again we see the magnificence of the patience of God without faith it is impossible to please him for he that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he is a reward of them that diligently seek him by faith Noah being warned of God of things not seen but he has faith to go right through though he's not seen a single thing it doesn't say he had any vision but he had the voice of God Noah being warned of God of things not seen as yet moved with fear now that sounds a little strange does it look at Hebrews chapter 5 and verse 7 please <clears throat> take off my foot my chains fell off almost thank you if it makes a hole you'll, you'll get a bill for it 
What do you want me to go higher or just this? Thank you, dear. Is that okay? <clears throat> Thank you. All right, Hebrews 5. Verse 5, so also Christ glorified not himself to be made an high priest, but he that said unto him, Thou art my son, today have I begotten thee, as he saith also in another place, Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek, who in the days of his flesh, when he offered up prayers and supplications with strong crying and tears, unto him that was able to save him from death, and was heard in that he feared, you've got to work that out for yourself, I won't touch that, Though he were a son, yet he learned obedience by the things which he suffered. What did Noah do? Because he was moved with fear. What does that mean? <coughs> well, I coined the phrase for it myself. Devout respect. It isn't a cringing, clinging, it doesn't mean moved with terror. It means move with deep love, deep devout regard for a holy one that I do not want in any shape or form to fall short of what he's asking me to do. So nor is move with fear. It's not, pardon me, Jesus is moved with fear in that verse. I copied this from an old saint that wrote it. It is not said here that he learned to obey by, by, uh, <coughs> by fear. Because he was always obedient. It says a little further on in the 10th chapter there. And in the 40th Psalm, it's the same thing. That he delighted to do the will of God. He wouldn't delight to do the will of God if he was terrified. But he so loves the will of the Father that whatever the cost may be, he's willing to um, pay that cost. Let me look here a minute. I should have brought my testament to have that mark, but there you are. <coughs> Let's look at Ephesians chapter 2 here. Ephesians 2 and verse 9 or verse 8 For by grace are ye saved through faith and that not of yourselves it is the gift of God not of works lest any man should boast now don't stop there there's a period for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works we're not saved by them, but we're saved to do them. What did it say about Jesus? He went about doing good. What's the ministry of the church? To go about doing good in the same way. So when people want to stop there at that ninth verse, <coughs> it, oh, well, of course we're saved, but it's not of works lest any man should boast. That's an old thing recited millions of times, I guess. But it says, we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Now that fear again is a, a devout respect. You know, one of the awesome things about the day in which we live, and I, I think that the most cruel, in fact one of the leading scientists says today, this is the most cruel generation that has ever lived. With the advance of the intellect, we've discovered how to destroy more than to create good things. After all, atom bombs were not produced in, in Methodist prayer meetings or Pentecostal prayer meetings. The evil genius of man comes out. I was reading here in Romans, you know this chapter, just let me refresh you here. In, in, in Romans chapter 1. Read 
even, verse 18, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. They have the truth. There are millions of people in America who might have the truth. They've heard it over and over again. It's pounded into their minds. They listen to TV or radio gospel preaching. They have Bibles. They've listened to preaching. They've listened to some of them since they were at the mother's knee. But they hold the truth in unrighteousness. It doesn't affect them in any shape or form. Because that which may be known of God is manifest in them. For God hath showed it unto them. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were they one thankful. They became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened, professing themselves wise to become fools. They change the glory of the incorruptible God into an image like to corruptible man or to birds or four-footed creatures. Verse 24, Wherefore God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lusts of their own heart, to dishonor their bodies between themselves. They change the truth of God into a lie. They worshipped and served the creature more than the creator, and who is blessed forever. For this cause God gave them up to vile affections, and even their women did change their natural use into that which is unnatural. Likewise also men leaving natural of men, burned in their lust one to another, men with men working that which is unseemly, receiving in themselves the recompense of error which was meet. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them up to a reprobate mind. They're filled, the next verse says, with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetous, and malice, full of envy, they murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whispering, backbiters, haters of God, deceitful, proud, despiteful, boasters, boasters, inventors of evil things, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents without understanding, covenant breakers without natural affection, implacable, unmerciful, who knowing the judgment of God that they which commit such things are worthy of death not only do the same but have pleasure in them. Now, wouldn't you think that people loaded with all that wretched corruption would flee to God for refuge? Wouldn't you think they'd all be saying, other refuge have I none, hangs my helpless, but they wallow in their uncleanness, they delight in it, they boast in it, they compete in it. And God in mercy sits there and does nothing. And because he does nothing, people think he can't do anything. He can, but he doesn't, not until the, there's a day appointed. What this tragic world has forgotten is that God has appointed a day in which this Christ, whose throne is forever and ever, that one day all roads lead. I was talking, remember, about the second time I talked with Keith Green, and I don't know how it came up. Something we said about all roads, and he equipped one thing I've never forgotten. I don't remember anything else he said, actually. We talked so often for hours. But he said, Len, when you think of it, all roads lead to the judgment seat of Christ. They do. Whether they go right through the middle of a ghetto, whether they go right through an area where all the film stars live, whether it's a main road through all the intellectuals in universities, scholarships, science, they all lead to the judgment seat of Christ. His throne is forever and ever. And yet all these brute beasts here, these people that have no fear of God, <coughs> It says that they, are not, that they have no fear. There's no fear of God before their eyes. Now the opposite is true in the life of the believer. Why do these people so implicitly follow all the details? Why does a man stand for a hundred years a scorn and ridicule if they had newspapers? I don't think they had, but it was a gossip thing. This poor man, Noah, he's a marvelous man. He has a wonderful character. He never gets angry, he's very patient. He's, a, he's kind of a godlike fellow, except he's an idiot building that ark. I told you, was it, no, not last week, the week before, how profoundly moved I was, and I'm still moved to tell you the truth. In reading up uh, here, reading back in Genesis, what's the chapter, about the sixth? In 
the fifth chapter, pardon me. Verse 21 says, Enoch lived sixty and five years and begat Methuselah. Enoch walked with God after he begat Methuselah, Methuselah three hundred years. And he begat sons and daughters. And all the days of Enoch were three hundred and sixty-five. And Enoch walked with God and was not for God took him. Methuselah lived a hundred, a hundred and eighty-seven children, years and begat Lamech. Look at the middle of the next verse. Lamech lived seven hundred and eighty-two years and begat sons and daughters. <coughs> Enoch begat sons and daughters. Methuselah begat sons and daughters. Look at chapter 7 and verse 1. <coughs> The Lord said unto Noah, Come thou and all thy house. What did the sons and grandchildren of Methuselah do? What did all the children of, of, of Enoch do? My guess is they helped build the ark. They wouldn't have nuts and bolts. They, had, they didn't even use uh, nails in the way we use them. They used wood. I'm convinced all those hundreds and hundreds of people must have done all that fabulous work. What does, what does he do? He stands a ridicule of the crowd, dear old Noah. Where did he get all the money? I don't know. It must have cost a fortune. But those people deliberately ignored all that he said. I cannot think for a moment that all these people, Methuselah's children, perish without knowing God. Or shall I say, without having knowledge of God. We know that Enoch was translated. Do you think that he lived all those years before his translation? Because he was 65 when he begat Methuselah, and he lived to be 365. And Methuselah had children and grandchildren. Can you imagine Enoch walking with God and not saying a thing to his children? Unless I'm mistaken, Enoch was the first prophet that ever lived. Read Jude. As I, I, I say I would like to, have, and I'm not facetious, I sure would have liked to have walked behind God and Enoch when they were having conversation. What did God do? He showed him the Lord coming with 10,000 of his saints. Do you think he began with the last chapter, not with the first chapter? I believe he explained, explained to him that third chapter in Genesis, why the, why the beast was slain, a type of the Lord Jesus Christ. I believe he showed him the mysteries of the, that God doesn't have to show us. Again, I find it, and I mean this in a way I can't explain I find it terribly embarrassing to be a Christian today. If these men could walk with God through hell, and that's what Enoch did, it, and that's what Noah did, it was the most corrupt thing that had ever come to the earth. Homosexuality was wild, impure, I read it to you in that chapter. They gave up their natural use and became abnormal. And yet in the midst of all that corruption, a man can walk straight in a crooked world, he can be clean in a polluted world. And yet not one of those, this is awesome to me. Noah, you come into the ark with your family. Well, the grandchildren of my dear friend Enoch, my, my friend Methuselah. Well, you've warned them. Some of his grandchildren used to laugh at Enoch going down the street and he stood there and he declared he'd had a revelation, he'd had a vision. They didn't know a thing about that. They'd never had a Bible, they'd never had a prophet. It's worse than talking Greek. Just one man has had the total revelation. If you ask me why God doesn't give you the revelation, I'll tell you don't because you've got it there in your hand, that's why. You don't need a nightmare that's going to shatter your mind almost to see thousands of people in the middle of the night when you're dreaming suddenly have a revelation, God splits the heavens and you have a preview of eternity. You've got it there in the book. I was going to say Sunday night again, I didn't say it. 
I quote it from the fifth chapter there of Revelation. In the fourth chapter there, John says, I saw a door in heaven. I've used that before, I know, but when we were at home, my mother would say, Len, don't go in the front room, particularly when it's Christmas time, you know. Don't dare to go in the, in the lounge, as we call it. She thought it was a command, I thought it was a challenge. So when she wasn't looking, I went. I'd run to my sister and say, Annie, come and look in the front room. But when we said we hadn't to go, well, she's not around. You don't say anything, I won't say anything. And we go open the door and we peep in and see the table loaded with parcels. I guess that's a doll, I guess that's something. There we were. I say that God pity me in one sense saying it. If I could open the door of heaven just an inch, you know, like that, here's the door, and I could, I could open it like that, and you could squint through it and see a way there into eternity. I say again, we never backslide, we never grumble, we never doubt, and it's all laid out for us. The good book tells us one day we're going to sit down with Abraham and Isaac and all those marvelous saints of all the ages. Do you think anybody, well people won't believe me, good night, and they can read it. They certainly didn't believe uh, Enoch. They laughed, and they perished. <coughs> Somebody quoted today the, uh, oh, Martha would remember I'm sure, but anyhow, let me try and get a hold of it. The, un, what do they say, the un, what? Not the un, unfinished love of God, what was they said, that boundless, can't remember how, what, what phrase was used, what was it? Oh you weren't there, I thought you were in my office, this lady mentioned it anyhow, she said the uh, un, not the unmerited, the, uh, pardon? No, it wasn't even that. It, it, what it meant actually was the endless love of God, that, that God's love is forever and ever and ever. If it was, he wouldn't make hell. There's a cut-off point of God's dealings with people and God's dealings with nations. I suppose all these folks said again, oh, the, this man building this, he's a, he's a nice guy, he never cheat, you know, when he's selling cattle or anything. But look at the ridiculous things that he does. Well, if we get excited in prayer, oh, well, you don't need to get it. You just pray, you know, pray a nice little prayer. I mean, that's all right. You don't need to sweat and toil and have any passion, any vision. Well, that's why the church is in the mess that it's in now. We're, we're totally without excuse. We've the full revelation of the character of God, the nature of God, the dealings of God, the purposes of God, the finality that comes when God deals with people. Well, again, the very opposite is true. But we're, we're not moved with fear in the sense he was. Maybe we should be. We prefer to quote the uh, statements of John, don't we? Romans 3.18 again says these, these corrupt, wretched people, there's no fear of God before their eyes. I'm going to spread that a bit further. I don't believe there's much fear of God amongst the children of God anymore. Never mind those people. We act as though, well, God's gracious, he understands, everything will work out good. No, he won't. What was it, Billy? Sunday quoted that phrase, or invented that phrase, payday someday? Or as an American cowboy preacher put it, the last roundup. I modernize it, call it the final checkout counter. Isn't that going to be something? Again, we are responsible for this generation. It must have been something to know, to turn around and look and see the children of Methuselah and the children of Enoch and others that he knew that, that time and time again had heard the voice of God. And yet they perished. I've got a friend now, he's a young man that really got through into victory in my meetings and that has made a marvelous man of God. He's only young in his twenties yet. 
and he's had some real acceptance in preaching he's just been in Australia preaching and had a great time there he's going back there in a few months to preach with Leighton Forth at the moment he's behind the iron curtain God has singularly blessed that young man what's he doing? he's, he's booking up and up and up and up to preach in meetings I said to David the other day only two Davids in the world my David and Dave Wilco and they're both mine anyhow so anyhow I said Dave I got a brochure uh, what, what do you call it a schedule yesterday from a young man oh so immaculately dressed and his darling wife has been and had you know all the repairs done <clears throat> and there she is so beautiful at the side of him and two little children there he sends me schedule, schedule whichever school you went to <clears throat> and I count it 52 weeks next year sure he has 31 crusades in 52 weeks totally ridiculous the strength of Dave Wilkerson amongst other things is that the man knows when to quit he has to get a new letter out every three weeks so he goes and hides in some place in town there in a, in a motel for two or three nights never gives me his number even I don't want to know it people ask for his number I say I can't give you it give you his office number now in January and February at least January, February, maybe March he's going to hide away and get away with God to wait on him, hear his voice finish off a book he's been working on for a while but the man has the sense to be still and know that it's got, he's not carrying some moth-eaten sermons around what these fellows do, they uh, <coughs> they get a bunch of sermons, go from one country to another, to another, to another and it's destructive because they clog their own thinking God hath not given us the spirit of fear but the spirit of love and of power and of a sound mind that's the redemptive work of God in Christ let me go back there to the uh, <coughs> Hebrews this verse I quoted Hebrews 5.7 I'm sorry I got the wrong page myself speaking of Jesus who in the days of his flesh when he had offered up prayers and supplications with strong crying and tears unto him that was able to save him from death and was heard in that he feared or had devout respect though he were a son yet he learned, learned he obedience by the things which he suffered again this old writer said it is not said here that he learned to obey because he had always obeyed I looked up that 10th chapter again which is a, an echo actually from Psalm 40 he did always the will of God he did always those things which please the Father neither is it that the lesson of obedience was forced upon him because again he said I delight to do thy will O God an old writer called Lindsay expresses it this way he says the true meaning is when he says that he acquired the actual experience of what it means to obey in hopeless circumstances or overwhelming circumstances he had to go through that as a man the physical human side of him the things that overwhelmed him that, that never overwhelmed any other person when he's in Gethsemane he says all thy billows that prophetic psalm says all thy billows have gone over me the experience when God left him for a little period so that God wouldn't have to leave us forever and ever there's an old Hebrew scholar in Scotland years ago he was actually a Scotsman but they nicknamed him Rabbi Duncan <coughs> because he had such a profound knowledge of Hebrew 
and in New College Edinburgh he took all his lessons, all his teaching, not from a, a lexicon, he took it from the uh, original Hebrew. And one of his specialities was dealing for every semester, as you would say, every time freshmen came he took that one chapter amongst others and dealt with the 53rd chapter of Isaiah. When it says the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. I read today where somebody said the intense suffering of Jesus hanging on the cross. Well pardon me I doubt if it was any more intense than to the dying thieves. One of the great hymns of Isaac Watts says thy bloody sweat, thy grief and pain. Didn't the dying thieves feel the pain as they hung on the cross? Were nailed? Sure they did. And the Catholic Church made a lot out of that. They have these great things, these great crosses with a plastic Christ and blood painted on the hands and on the feet. But what does Isaiah say? His soul was made an offering for sin. His soul. The greatest pain in the world is not the pain of a woman bringing a child into the world. The greatest pain in the world is soul pain, soul agony, soul travail. Why do so few people learn that experience of travailing in the spirit? Again, Jonathan Edwards pre preachers almost skit at him because he had a big solemn face and a big nose and he took a candle and he read monotonously, never changed the tone of his voice and he preached on sinners in the hands of an angry God and people fell off their seats and writhed and, and, and so forth in agony of conviction and, and he didn't offer them any mercy. He just lacerated them with the word of God. What God says, he, he punched them and punched them. It's like kicking a man when he's down. But his wife says, you'll never see the other side of him. He's very severe when he preaches because he dwells on the holiness of God so much. And the more you see the blazing purity of God, the more you see the corruption of corruption. And she says he lays on his rug and he weeps for hours. 